say muted the last time I saw. Ian? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Great. Welcome. And uh, Ian is from University of Toronto. Take it away. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of Toronto, and today I'll be talking about uh, similarity metric learning on the L1000 connectivity map. Okay, so L1000, uh, the L1000 data set, uh, which was originally published in 2017 uh, by the Broad Institute, uh, is an example of a, a perturbational data set. Uh, these data sets measure changes in some sort of biological feature space due to perturbations like compound treatment or uh, genomic reagents. So, um, L1000 in particular measures changes in gene expression uh, in cancer cell lines as a result of uh, perturbation. Uh, another example of a perturbational data set is uh, the cell painting morphological assay, which is also from the Broad, uh, which you know similarly uh, measures changes uh, due to perturbation by compounds and, and genetic reagents. But the feature space is uh, morphological features, so um, imaging of, of cells after treatment. Uh, these data sets can be thought of as matrices, where uh, the rows are your features and the columns are, are signatures of the changes uh, induced by perturbation. So uh, the applications of these, uh, sorry, uh, the applications of these data sets, um, I mean, there, there are a couple different things you can do with them. Uh, uh, for example, you can characterize unknown compounds by taking the signature of an unknown compound and identifying compounds that produce similar changes or, or genetic reagents. Uh, you can nominate therapeutics for a disease state. Uh, and, and these um, analyses require identifying similar signatures. But it's, it's not obvious what, what similarity means. Uh, so similarity is defined by a, a function, a similarity function, which is related to a distance function. Uh, it operates, it takes two vectors, and um, those vectors which are, which are similar, which uh, are you know, close to each other, uh, are, you know, given a score of close to one, and if they're dissimilar, their, their score would be zero or, or minus one. Some canonical examples are things like uh, Pearson and Spearman correlation, uh, gene set enrichment analysis, or, or cosine similarity. Um, and, you know, similarity functions are used for all sorts of analyses, like uh, clustering and model fitting. And so I, I maintain that a good similarity function, because there is a, a very vast space of these, but it's, it's one that correctly discriminates uh, related pairs of signatures from unrelated pairs. And you know, of course, the only way to really assess this is if you have some sort of a priori benchmark where you know that uh, pairs in orange here are similar and you expect that a good function will uh, make this distribution of similarities different from the distribution of all uh, pairs of signatures. So the technique that I'm using uh, is from the field of self-supervised learning, which is a discipline in machine learning. Uh, and self-supervised learning learns an embedding that brings pairs that are known a priori to be similar. Uh, so for example, these two pictures of a signature, uh, a handwritten signature, they bring it, it, it learns an embedding that brings these close together while leaving uh, samples that are dissimilar far apart. And it's been vi widely successful in, in fields like image processing and natural language processing. Uh, the key idea is that it, it uses label-free data augmentations. So you start out with, say, a picture of a dog and can apply a series of transformations that leave the identity of the sample unchanged uh, while still generating new data. And importantly, you don't need to know that this is a picture of a dog to use this technique. These are all uh, assumed uh, to be similar. So they're supposed to be the same class. And so you can then learn the embedding to bring these guys close together. Uh, that doesn't really work well in biology because learning a, a, an augmentation operation that preserves the identity of the sample while being meaningful is, is pretty hard in biology. Um, so the solution is to use replicate data. We can take a signature of a perturbation in some cell context, uh, and the onset or the assumption is that, that uh, replicates of that signature uh, should tend to be similar to each other, whereas uh, different signatures uh, you know, are not assumed to be similar. So we want to bring replicate similarities close together while leaving the distribution of similarities for other pairs of signatures unchanged. So um, we begin with, with cosine similarity, just a, a basic inner product. 
And we modify it by introducing this, this parameter M. This is a, a matrix, and there are a lot of different formulations of this, uh, and, and we, we've experimented with quite a few. The one that I'm going to talk about here is, is a very simple linear transformation, where this is a matrix, and you have two unitary matrices and some reweighting on uh, you know, principal component space. This learns an embedding on your original data space, and this defines a similarity function. And so we can then optimize this parameter M in such a way that replicate similarities uh, shown here in red are brought close together, whereas similarities of non-replicates are, are kept apart. Uh, conceptually, what this you know, very simple linear transformation is doing is stretching the data set along axes of variation in such a way that uh, ground truth, uh, in particular replicate similarity, uh, is, is maximized. Uh, so our benchmarking here, uh, is as follows. So to begin, we, we train uh, a metric starting from some training data set, which has replicate structures. So we know that these columns are the same and these columns are, are replicates and so on. Um, we can then apply it to two different uh, benchmark uh, data sets. So first we can apply it to replicates. So same compound, but unseen compounds and in unseen cells. So this is data that was not seen in the training step. And then for a more realistic case, we can apply it to uh, compounds or signatures of compounds that have the same mechanism of action, but aren't necessarily replicates. So these could, for example, be two EGFR inhibitors. Uh, and then we can benchmark it by looking at the similarities of our ground truth compared to the similarities of, of all other pairs and the ranks of our ground truth compared to all pairs, and then compare these uh, you know, two or more different metrics. So uh, th this, to just give a little bit of intuition, this is the how the embedding, sorry, the, how the embedding has changed the similarity distribution. So on the left, you have cosine similarity of signatures, uh, compound signatures in HEPG2, which is a, a liver cell line from L1000, where replicate similarities are in red and non-replicates are in blue. And on the right, you have the learned metric. So you've done the embedding and, and uh, are computing this rectified cosine. And as you can see, the, the, the distribution is shifted somewhat. Um, but this, this doesn't just shift the distribution. Um, replicate recall is improved. So if you look at the ranks of replicate pairs compared to the entire data set, um, that, that this figure here shows the CDF of, of replicate ranks, where most similar pairs are on the left, least similar pairs are on the right. And uh, uh, this is the fraction of replicate pairs that are recovered. What you can see is that the learned metrics uh, shown here in purple and orange, these are two variations trained on two different cell contexts, show improved replicate recall compared to your sort of conventional off-the-shelf uh, similarity functions. Uh, in that you see this, this lift near uh, ranks of zero. And uh, in the more practical case of trying to identify compounds with the same mechanism of action, uh, you see that rectified cosine, this learned metric, uh, does better identifying pairs of, of compounds that have the same mechanism of action than cosine does. Um, as you can see, there's, there's an increase in, in small rank pairs uh, in this case where we know that there's a ground truth. And if you uh, adjust you know, for the false discovery rate uh, at a particular threshold of, of the false discovery rate, the learn metric uh, improves the recall by uh, you know, 10 to 20 percent uh, of pairs of compounds. So th this is pretty substantial when this is, this is just a computational technique. There's no um, sort of legwork being involved apart from learning a new similarity function. Uh, very briefly, uh, we see the same results when applied to uh, the cell painting perturbational data set, which again uses cell morphology features. Uh, you see the distributions uh, have shifted using the learn metric, which is here on the right. Uh, and in, which, which, you know, the, the metric on the left is kind of saturated. You see an improved discrimination uh, on the right near the high end. And again, we see that replicate pairs are better discriminated by the learned metric, uh, controlling for false discovery rates. Uh, you see a, a more modest improvement than in L1000, but you're still looking at something like five to 10% improvement in the fraction of replicate pairs you're able to recall. And as with uh, L1000, compounds that have the same mechanism of action show improved recall with the learned uh, similarity function. Uh, this turns out to be a pretty hard problem in the cell painting space, which um, my collaborators are familiar with. Uh, but you're still seeing improvement using the, the learned distance function. Uh, so briefly to, to kind of recap, um, there, there are kind of two interpretations um, of this 
method. For one, you have uh, an improved similarity calculation that's able to better uh, recover known biology and presumably discover novel biology. And you can also think of this as an embedding in, in a, a new space that may be more appropriate um, for applications like clustering or modeling. This is a, a more natural basis for the data. Uh, we're in the process of uh, submitting uh, a package to Bioconductor that I'm calling BioSimLearn for now um, to enable researchers to apply this method to learn similarity functions specific to their data sets. Um, it's, I mean, all you need to use it is, you know, some data matrix with uh, re known replicate structures some kind of ground truth that you can use to train the model to recognize um, replicates and it has a range of applications. Um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, to my collaborators and, and please reach out to me if, if you have data sets that uh, you would be interested in using this on. Thank you.